Thank you. So 50 minutes, I'm going to start uh, straight in. Um, this is one of my first designs. And uh, as you can see, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> was it a, a bicycle or a table? Uh, I'm still not sure. In any case, it was a, was a great commercial success. I sold, uh, I made them for 20 pounds and I sold them for 100. And uh, I sold 10 of them. <laughs> the next, uh, next project was also a bit confused. It was half chair, half table. And uh, the result of, of long hours of sketching. I had planned to call it the drinking man's chair but uh, I went to a, a shop to buy some pipe cleaners to make the model, and uh, the packet was called The Thinking Man. So that's how it, how it got its name. Uh, at, that, at that time in my career, I was very much into imagining spaces, imagining atmospheres, and the drawing on the left is uh, is a kind of visualization of the kind of room I was imagining. And I found that very helpful in, in, in working out what kind of furniture to do. That uh, rug is called the rug of many bosoms. <laughs> and uh, really it was a, I'm not naturally a very ornamental person, but that was a way of kind of getting to grips with ornament and uh, <laughs> trying to find, find reason for ornament. The next project's also a bit confused, part flower pot, part table. But these early experiments were ways of, of without actually making anything, of using components which were semi-industrial to get a result that, that kind of mirrored the world of production. And it was supposed to be a hat stand. These uh, three green bottles started life as, as ordinary wine bottles, actually. And the reason they, I used wine bottles was, was uh, at the time in Berlin, I couldn't find any glass blowing company and the best we could do was just heat up the necks and fold the tops over. But while doing it, I realized that actually the, the wine bottles themselves were very beautiful objects. And so it stands today as a sort of uh, homage to the, the beauty of ordinary things. They were part of a, of a room set I was working on in Berlin. In Berlin. I had a, a kind of three months project there and uh, I decided to make a room. This was about, probably about the time of Memphis or a bit after. Certainly it was a bit after. And it was really my reaction against Memphis. Uh, I, at that time I had the feeling that, that Memphis and design in general was, was, uh, had sort of skipped a stage and was designing things stri straight for museums and missing out the, the actual consumer. So I wanted to get back to very ordinary atmospheres and ordinary pieces. And one of the pieces was this chair, which um, really took its form and its, its material from the fact that I had to make it myself. I'm not naturally a, a very gifted in the craftsmanship uh, category. And so I, I, I really decided just to, to make it with, a, with an electric uh, jigsaw and to cut it out of a flat sheet of plywood. Um, the only thing being that the seat was a much thinner sheet of plywood to provide a bit of cushioning. And uh, 
I was intrigued by the, by the idea that you could turn this very two-dimensional material into something very three-dimensional. Another sketch from, from that project. This was the kind of atmosphere that I, I found the most uh, convivial. It was a, a table, uh, two glasses, a bottle of wine, and two chairs. And still today, it seems to me that, that so many designer restaurants are, are overdone, over over-designed in a way, and, and as designers, we're quite often responsible for designing away the atmosphere completely. That was the room itself, um, built in a, a gallery in Berlin. This was my first industrial project for a German company called FSB. And, uh, was a door handle that I modeled. On, on the left, you see the model in, in plaster. And that really gave me a lot of assurance to actually have, have uh, designed something that was in production. And the inspiration for it came from this illustration out of a, a, a book of components for, for coaches and cars, early cars. And this coach handle, just when I saw it, seemed to me to have all the characteristics of, of what a handle should be. So I literally took, took direct inspiration from that shape and turned it into a, a modern door handle. And the doorknob that, that went with it came from a light bulb. So I think, just to go back to that one, a lot, of, a lot of inspiration, I think, can be found in very, very mundane places and mundane objects. And I, in, a, in a strange way, I'd already, by this time, decided that I didn't want to be a creator in the sense of, of trying to draw shapes, although I still do a bit. I prefer the attitude that, you can, that, that we are kind of reprocessors as, as designers. This project is called uh, Atlas Table, and um, really was the result of me not wearing my spectacles. I was sitting in a cafe one day, and look, looking across the room, I saw a beautiful table. And putting on my spectacles, I saw that it was actually a, a kind of optical effect of the shadow of the tabletop making visible the whole of the top part, and then the sun hitting the, the chrome bar lower down, making it look much thinner. And um, so I had adapted that shape. And um, that's really another, another role of the designer, I think, is to be aware, aware, of, uh, aware enough to spot these opportunities. This later on came to be a, a very big series of tables. Um, simply by adjusting the length of the, lead, of the leg and choosing different top sizes. This was a first plastic project, um, a very simple idea of molding uh, one half of a product and using two, two of them to make a three-dimensional shape. In this case, it's a bottle rack. I put this photo in, um, it's a photo I took in India, and to me it just sums up what, what design should be about. It's uh, the leaf of a bigger tree protecting the younger tree. And I put it in to, to remind me to say that, that design is all about using materials to, the, to, their, to their best use to the, in the most econ economic way. And. Uh, that's such a beautiful example of, of using what you find at hand. This project was a, a bus stop for the city of Hanover. And uh, we, were all, we were asked as a group of, uh, of designers and architects to each do a, an individual bus stop for the city. And um, 
there were many crazy shapes for bus stops being done, and um, mine was quite restrained, as you can see. For the press event, we all got in a bus and we drove around all the different bus stops, stopping at each one, and the press would get off and have a look, and then we'd all get on the bus and go back, go to the next, next stop. Um, when we got to mine, I had two press people behind me say, this one looks really n normal, let's stay on the bus. <laughs> so I took that as a great compliment. And actually it got me a, got me a job uh, to design the tram for Hanover, which was a, a hell of a big project. It took me three years and um, really transformed our office from a very sort of amateur outfit into a more serious one, allowed us to, to get a decent, decent sized office. And although politically it was a nightmare getting the, the job done, we had a lot of fun doing the, the design, taking the attitude really just from, the, from personal experience, designing designing in a way that we, we would like it to be as a, as a passenger. And I think that's another very important aspect of design is to not to forget that we are ourselves consumers and that we should be using these, these objects we design. This is uh, for Rosenthal, it's a ceramic uh, service. Uh, the plates have been sawn in half just to show the shape. And here a project for a, a monastery designed by Le Corbusier called La Tourette. And um, you probably can't see it because it's a very small image, but that's in the top left-hand corner of the right photo. There's a, a bench that was in the chapel. And uh, I visited the, the monastery before I did the job. And seeing those benches, they had such a kind of religious poise to them that I decided to base the chair for the refectory on, on that gesture of the, the, these kind of rails on the floor which went out the back like a kind of praying person. Um, this is a project for Sony, which never got made. Um, it was a kind of tricky situation that we designed it for Sony Europe, who are based in England. And uh, there was a lot of infighting between Sony Japan and Sony Europe at that time. And Sony Europe were not considered good enough to have any products made. And so the, the Japanese Sony suppressed the project. But I had in my contract with them the right to publish it. And uh, I did publish it, you know, lab correctly labeled as a concept project. Nevertheless, people phoned up Sony and asked them if they could buy it. And um, eventually I got a, a call from Sony asking me to stop publishing it because too many people were, were asking to buy it. <laughs> These two projects, um, low pad and high pad, came about really um, from discovering a, a process of, of pressing up uh, foam, which is used in the car industry, and I adapted it to make a, a sort of uh, new and, and uh, slimline upholstery. I think taking away volume is, is, uh, in upholstery is, is always interesting if you can do it without sacrificing too much comfort. Uh, another aspect of my work is, is uh, occasional. I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a, a natural or I don't really enjoy it even, but occasionally I have to do um, showrooms, and in this case it's for Capellini in Milan. And the exhibition was called Homework and was during uh, Salone Furniture Fair in Milan. Um, I think we always have tried at Capellini. I've worked for Capellini a very long time now, and 
we've always tried to show the furniture in a more real way um, rather than putting it on a podium, tried to make uh, environments with it. These two images are, are collected from a, another lecture I did about anonymous objects. And I put them in just to remind me to talk about anonymous objects. And um, it's always struck me that anonymous objects are very often better than, than designed objects, which is okay. Of course, they're in most cases also designed, but why are they better? Um, when we are supposed to be the professionals. And I think the answer is that the, the motives behind the design are actually better than our motives. They're not done to seek publicity. Uh, they're simply done to get the job done, to do a good job. And uh, it's, always, it's always in the back of my mind uh, been a worry to me that, that you know, how, how do we compete with this, this kind of fact that we are known designers and, and yet we can't design as well as these, these more humble, invisible designers. And um, I think there's a great deal to be learned from that. And we should perhaps just, just try and question our motives for designing. This next project is called Opla and it's a uh, a tray and a table. The tray connects to the table. The idea being that you can serve and and take and then take the tray away when you finished. That was a, a beautifully engineered project uh, made by Alessi in Italy. And um, that's another another point I'd like to make is that many of these objects, which which appear so beautifully made, beautifully designed, very often are the result of, of an engineer, not just a designer who, who draws every, every detail, but very much a partnership between design and industry. Industry knowing best how to make things and designers perhaps having an influence on, on, on various options, making choices. But uh, there's a lot of, lot of help that comes from in industry and in good design. It's another Alessi project uh, called Tin Family. Just very simple spun stainless steel shapes. And a set of kitchen utensils. Around about this time I, I start, start to get very interested in, in objects which are, are less, uh, less showy, less designed because at the same time as I noticed anonymous design was good. I started to notice that, that objects that one wouldn't even put in a design category, objects that we use every day, were also, also extremely effective, uh, not just in, in, in use, but in, as sort of companions in life. Um, they make very good atmosphere and they do it without any, any kind of big show. So I tried to to learn from, from these two, two very discrete sources of, of products, what, what makes a good object. Rather like, like uh, the Vignelli's chair, it's um, made in one piece. It takes three minutes to make, and uh, it's quite strange to watch, to watch them come out of the machine. I should have included an image of that, but I, I forgot. Um, and that's... Uh, makes use of a technology called gas injection, which means that you can hollow out the, uh, the core of a plastic molding can be hollowed out and filled with air under pressure. Um, and that immediately frees the designer up from, from the old world uh, plastic molding design where ribs were necessary and a lot of very unpleasant details. So it makes for very smooth, fully, fully rounded shapes. And I was lucky enough to be very early on, on that technology. And this chair really, really grew out of the sample that I was given, which was a, a cylindrical section. 
slightly elliptical, uh, which was like a bone hollow in, on the inside. And I designed the chair literally from the leg up, just imagining if, if that was the leg of the chair, what would the rest of it look like? After that, we did a series of other projects, other products in using the same technology, this folding chair, um, which unfortunately is less successful. It costs more because instead of one piece, it's three pieces. And uh, I think in general, there was less demand for folding chairs than, than normal chairs. I enjoy very much the economy of, of ideas when, when one idea can lead to a, a whole series of, of products, which is either in, in a sense of a system or just in, in terms of a, a family of different models which, which provide different solutions or, or which meet different situations and needs. That's a project for Vitra, which is an office desk system. And um, the idea being that the, the so-called third level, the top level, uh, has these sort of plug-in uh, func functions or, or a holder for a light, some little trays which you can put loose things in or, or files. Underneath the table on the right, you can see the, the layout of a kind of rubbery cable tray. So you, instead of having to open a box or lift up the top, you just put in any adapters you need in there and feed the wires through the holes. So that project was all about demystifying the office, office um, desk, keeping all the functions, but just simplifying it so that it's not such a a scary machine. And a second light for Floss called Luxmaster. And this, uh, Piero Gandini asked me to design a, an uplighter, which at that time was very sort of out, outdated kind of light. I'm not sure why it's outdated, because I still think it, that kind of light is, is almost the nicest when it's bounced off the ceiling. In any case, I came up with the big problem with a, with a movable uplighter is always the cable, what to do with it. And um, I had the very s simple idea just to, to make it like a telephone wire and wrap it around the, the support. There was another show in, in uh, Tokyo uh, for Floss. And uh, at that time, I think I'd I designed it in a very modest way and sent the drawings off to, to Floss. And the answer came back that there was not, in, not enough globals in the window. So I went the other way and gave, gave him a kind of forest of globals. That you can see maybe on the left behind the bench. There's Jürgen's bench. It was the same project in Tokyo. And um, again, it was a situation where lots of people were invited to each design one bench for a street. Um, these kind of international design projects. And the area in Tokyo is called Rapongi Hills and had been a very, very nice local area eaten up by, this, by the giant Mori Building Corporation. And um, it's a, this particular street where the benches are is a very glamorous shopping street. And on my quest for keeping some kind of atmosphere, I decided that what that street would need at the end was not, not a tenth designer project, but something much more everyday or normal. And I settled on the idea of a sort of ex extruded park bench um, and with some satisfaction, I, whenever I pass it, I see people sitting there and eating lunch. And I think, again, we have to remember that while as designers we, we are praised for being creative, um, sometimes we need to, to hold it in a bit and uh, 
remember that, that things get used and that atmosphere is not necessarily better because we had a, a great creative urge. This sofa is called Oblong and it's held together by zips and um, it really it came about because I was so fed up with designing sofas um, for the Milan Furniture Fair which is a kind of I don't know how many new sofas there are every year in the Milan Fair but um, they're always perfect, they're always beautifully designed, international style, sophisticated and glamorous. And I thought at that time that there must be room for something more ugly. And um, I think I, I heard a few speakers talking about ugliness. And I think that's, that's a, a growing theme in design. Why, why are we all struggling to make everything so beautiful? Does it, is, it really, is that really beauty? Sometimes beauty can come from, from in other ways. So it's, it's a kind of module. You can zip it together as long as you want. It could be an armchair or it could be a 10-seater. And it can go around corners too. That project, the chair on the right, um, is actually the air chair inside and it's been covered with leather and stitched and that was a project I did with Capellini and the idea really was just to transform air chair from a, a 50, 50 euro chair, 50 pound, 60 euros, something like that, uh, into a, a very high class object and um, to give it another, a completely other life. And that's a kind of economy which, for me, is very much part of design. I think it's not just with materials that we have to be economic, but also with ideas. And very, very often the most pleasing designs are the ones with, where, where the thought has been most easily arrived at. This is um, a project which Hella is involved in too. This is the Vitra Home project. And um, on the left, there's various people's work, Burlex, uh and mine. Uh, I did these cork, cork tables for them, and um, which everyone calls stools for some reason. But the idea was that they were little side tables. And uh, I read an article that the cork forests in Spain were suffering from a, a kind of disease which meant that they didn't make very good wine corks anymore. They tended to, to make the wine go off. And so the cork trade was in very bad shape. And um, it's such a beautiful material. And uh, it seemed uh, appropriate to try and find a, a use for it. That's a chair also from the Vitra project. It's using a kind of elastic netting. Um, again, with the idea of reduce, reducing the volume of, of upholstery. And a table um, with a cast, cast leg in the corners and, and uh, spaced out by square tube, allowing all kinds of different um, proportions of table. And it, a marble top. This project was my biggest biggest disaster. Um, it was done for a French company called Roenta and it was our first product, serious product design job and uh, we put everything into it. It took us three years to finish it and uh, we were really counting on it because we hoped to get more work in that direction. Uh, and I think we, we did a reasonable job. This is an electric kettle. And um, unfortunately, it didn't work. It wouldn't switch off. And uh, water came out the, the base. They couldn't get it to seal properly. And I started to get letters from, from people in America telling me that I'd ruined their kitchens. And that's, I can tell you, with the internet these days, you, you are very much uh, available for comment if, if somebody doesn't like your, your product. 
So we still receive a lot of, a lot of uh, complaints about these. And uh, that was a painful lesson that you should... I don't know why it happened. I mean, normally they make kettles that work. Um, but you, you better choose your, your manufacturers well. So maybe it's what Massimo said about, about choosing good clients. The coffee maker, um, the coffee ran everywhere except in, into the jug. Uh, on the right you can see the, the idea that the lid lifts up and you can keep the filters in there and, and the spoon. And a toaster that um, has a, a motorized up and, up and down function which doesn't work. <laughs> so back to safer products. <laughs> this one's called uh, called Trash, and it's for Magis, a small company north of Venice. And just a very simple idea of trying to find a way that you don't have the plastic bag hanging out of the, the basket all the time. You can buy it with or without the lid, and the lid comes with this, this ring you can see in the right photo, which you wrap the bag around. That's a project for Samsung, which again, never got made. Um, we haven't had much luck with our product design yet. Um, in fact, they did a version of the one on the right, the, the uppermost right-hand one in America, but it was so, so much changed that, that it was hardly recognizable. That's an, a newish project for Capellini using the same old system as low pad and high pad but to create a, a proper reading chair and um, although low pad uh, I was always very pleased with the with the shape of low pad with the look of it it was never that comfortable and in fact I, I have one in my house and very rarely sit in it so I wanted to try and do a chair that I really would use and um, I thought it should be a reading chair, so this was the result. It tilts. Um, the headrest is held on by magnets, so you can turn it around or you can move it up and down. It's a, a free, free agent. That's a project for Alessi, pots and pans, and a very serious project, actually, we did in a very short time and uh, that's always good. I think projects which are, again, this is kind of this sense of a family of objects is, is always very pleasing to do because you have one idea and you, you make a lot of products and uh, there's a kind of efficiency to it. The main feature, I suppose, is the lid. I don't know if you can see on the left picture. It's got a kind of try try handle, um, which means that you can pick it up with a wooden spoon and turn it over and it's much more usable. And when, it, when, it, when you do turn it over and put it on the kitchen top, it's, it sits straight. It doesn't fall off. That on the right, I'll just go back. Um, that's another Alessi project called Knife Fork Spoon. And this was really the first time that I'd I tried to do something so normal as this. It took us five years to do it. And um, it's incredible how if you, we all use a fork every day, a few times a day. And if you try and draw a fork, try to, try to just sketch a fork, you'd be amazed how difficult it is. And so actually getting to know what a, what a good fork is, is what took most of the time. We kept doing drawings confidently, thinking that we'd designed a beautiful fork. And we got back prototypes, which were just horrible. And it really, I think we did five separate prototypes until we got to this, this result, which is, is pretty fork, fork, knife, and spoon-like. I really was getting more and more interested in, in this a kind of design, maybe, that wasn't anymore going to try and, try and surprise anybody but which would be really enjoyable to live with. 
because it seemed to me, looking around my house, that my favorite objects were, were not so much the sensational ones, but the, the more discreet ones. And in some cases, I'd been using them for many years before realizing how fantastic they were. So things like a, a chopping board, for example, with a, a slightly curved edge on, on, the, on all, all sides so that it's easier to pick up. And when you wash it, you lean it against the top and the wood grain doesn't pick up the, up, doesn't pick up the water because there's such a small point area of contact. So noticing things like that after using them for, for several years, I started to realize that objects, it's an incredibly sophisticated world. Um, and sometimes our attempts as designers are, are really laughable beside, beside the evolution of, of certain objects. Many objects look like they look, in, in, many normal objects look like they look because they've been refined over years to do, to do their job. And so this, this project was really a, a first attempt at, at doing something much more normal. And, um, I really, I was really worried about it because I just thought it would would be, it would go unnoticed and it wouldn't be, would probably not be bought. Um, but it was bought and it's very successful. Um, and I think that that gave me a lot of confidence to to pursue this idea. And I was in the Milan Fair and I saw a, a stool by a, a Japanese designer called Naoto Fukusawa who you probably all know. And um, it seemed to me that that was very much the same, trying to do the same kind of thing. And later that day, I was talking to a, a guy from Muji. And um, I mentioned these two projects. And he said, super normal. And so super, when the minute he said super normal, to me, that, that really, that was it. That was the name for for these kind of projects. And I, in conversation with Naoto, we, we came up with the idea of trying to, we discussed what is supernormal, what does it mean? We came up with the idea of, of trying to find out what it meant by making an exhibition. And the first exhibition was held in Tokyo uh, about a year ago, I think now. And we showed it again in London and we will show it in Milan at the, uh, during the furniture fair in April at the Triennale. And Supernormal is a collection of objects which, which have this characteristic of, of being normal, but somehow more than normal. And uh, I think we learned slowly that, that in, in many ways, Supernormal objects, you can't really design them they become supernormal through through use almost. Um, and so we collected together 200 objects and we could have collected thousands more. Some of them are by designers, some of them are anonymous, and some of them are incredibly familiar. You can see those scissors with the orange hand, orange uh, handle. So it's all about, it's about familiarity and, and objects which we use without without uh, consideration even, but they're, they're part of our life and they make an atmosphere um, without making a fuss about it. Um, I think the, the kind of explosion of, of media interest in design recently has, is having a very negative effect on, on, on the design world itself. I think many designers are, are many younger designers seeing this, this kind of media uh, celebration of design are convinced in a sense that, that uh, what they see in the magazines is design. Uh, but I think on the other hand, the media are just interested in selling magazines. So the more sensational the, the product is, the more likely they are to put it on the cover or make a big fuss about it. And. Um, I think it's having a very distorting effect on design. Um, and it's quite understandable that as a young designer, you need to get known, you need to have your work seen. 
but I, I think we need to remember that as designers we are responsible for, for our environment um, and filling it with, uh, with amazing shapes and forms and surprising expressions of our genius uh, doesn't make a very good atmosphere. And in, in fact, it's, to me, is becoming a, a kind of visual pollution. So supernormal, really, the idea of, of, of the exhibition uh, is to make a, a discussion about it to, as, a, as a sort of gentle reminder that, that the motivations of design uh, are quite important and, and good objects don't always come from just wanting to, to be noticed. Uh, so I hope uh, if any of you go to Milan, you'll, you'll be able to see that. Some more views. The ladder actually wasn't chosen, uh, but I think we should get one. So that's just some examples of the kind of objects which, which we chose. So supernormal objects can also be objects which, which we're just so used to that we barely notice, uh, like the Bialetti coffee machine or, or the glass in front of it we might have used hundreds of times without even thinking about it. But if you actually look at it, you realize that it is actually an incredibly effective and beautiful object. So this is our last picture. And this project was a couple of years ago in Milan and it's called The Crate. And it came about, I had it in my apartment I just moved in and there wasn't much furniture there. And I adapted a, a, a wine crate, which looks exactly like this, as a bedside table. And I started to use it and found that I could stack up some books in the bottom of it. And it just, for me, it was perfect, the perfect solution for a bedside table. And so I made it in all innocence, thinking that, that it was a, a nice offering and it caused a huge amount of uh, trouble, actually. People complained about it and uh, were saying that my motivations were, were cynical and, and uh, I can't remember what else the problem was, but um, I don't know, that sort of uh, struck a note with me that there's something very wrong with the design world at the moment if, if you can't do a, a simple product like the crate without being criticized. But um, anyway, that's not a very good note to end with, but uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>